Welcome back to History Class with Dr. W. We're continuing our discussion of 1920 to 45, and in this section, the triumph of nativism in the early to mid 1920s. And in fact, in this fourth and final installment in this part of the lecture, we're going to talk about nativism triumphant, which is exemplified in the Immigration Act of 1924. In the previous lectures, we've talked about the Red Scare itself uh, and the Ku Klux Klan and the predominant feeling of nativism, that is, fear of immigrants, that persisted in the early to mid-1920s. Congress, in fact, rode this wave of anti-immigrant sentiment. In December of 1920, the House passed a bill to suspend all immigration for a year by a vote of 196 to 42, a landslide. The Senate didn't pass the bill, shelved the bill for more discussion, and soon substituted what was known as the Dillingham Quota Bill, proposed by Senator William P. Dillingham of Vermont. He had headed the United States Immigration Commission from 1909 to 1911. The Dillingham Quota Bill proposed to limit immigration based on the number of immigrants that had previously been admitted, using a percentage for each nationality. According to this bill, the figures could be adjusted periodically to reflect changes in national interest. Dillingham's bill proposed to use the 1910 census figures, which were the most recent figures available, place no quotas on Mexico or Canada or any other quote-unquote new world nation. Asians were already excluded by other acts, except for a very small number of Japanese and Filipinos, which were a U.S. territory. The number of Europeans was set at 5% of the population in the United States for each group as of 1910. So the bulk of those allowed would be Germans, British, and Scandinavians, about 600,000 total slots for Europeans, many of which would probably not be filled. The bill went back to the House, which then proceeded to lower the figure to 3% of the population, about 350,000 total, which would be the quota for that time. Woodrow Wilson pocket vetoed the bill on his way out, meaning he didn't sign it or veto it, he just left it alone. He was on his way out of office. But Warren G. Harding signed it soon after becoming president. In May 1922, it was extended for another two years, which set up a great debate over immigration in the election year of 1924. In the 1920s, the United States was relatively prosperous but divided between old-stock, Protestant, small-town America and immigrant-stock, Catholic, big-city America. These divisions were reflected in the 1924 Immigration Act. The nativists were still immensely powerful, and as I mentioned, the Klan was at the height of its influence at that time. So, most in Congress wanted to continue with the quota system, but with a few changes. They sought even fewer total immigrants, so lowering the percentage. And many also wanted to use an earlier census, ultimately arriving at the 1890 census, rather than 1920, which was the one that was currently in use at that time. Now, what impact do you think that would have? If we think about the difference between the 1890 census and 1910 or 1920, well, 1890 was just at the early cusp of the wave of new immigrants. And so those nations who had seen millions of immigrants coming in during that era of the new immigrants would see their numbers vastly decreased by using an earlier census like 1890 rather than 1910 or 1920. So if we look at a couple of examples, we can think about for Italians using the 1890 census instead of 1920 would lower their quota each year from 42,000 to 2,000. For the Polish, the number would drop from 31,000 to 6,000. 
So we see this dramatic decline as it applied to the new immigrants based on which uh, census we were using. Based on these proposals, Congress passed the Immigration Act of 1924. In its final rendition, the act did use the 1890 census, and it reduced the percentage from 3% to 2%. All told, this would allow in some 300,000 immigrants each year, roughly half coming from Europe. So this is a dramatic decline from the peak years of immigration in the early 19-teens. The act also declared the Japanese quote, aliens ineligible to citizenship, unquote, along with the Chinese. Now, their quota would only have amounted to about 200 immigrants each year. So this was uh, going out of their way to kind of slap the Japanese in the face with this act. The act also tightened the Immigration Administration and made deportation of immigrants easier. So this was a, an extremely harsh act uh, imposed upon immigrants during this time. So you can get a sense from this chart the impact that the Immigration Act of 1924 had on the number of immigrants that were allowed to come in. And you see that by far the greatest numbers allowed were what we might call old immigrants, those who had come in large numbers prior to 1890. So you see Germans, British, and Irish were still allowed to bring in large numbers. And still some preference even for those in Northern Europe, like Sweden, Norway, and France. It is the so-called new immigrants who suffered the most under this new act. If you look in that middle column or even the far right, Nations from Eastern Europe and Southern Europe, like Poland, Italy, Russia, and Yugoslavia, and so on, uh, saw the numbers dramatically decline as a result of this Immigration Act of 1924. Congressman Albert Johnson from Washington, who was the principal author of the act, justified the legislation by saying, quote, Today, instead of a well-knit, homogeneous citizenry, we have a body politic made up of all and every distinct element. Today, instead of a nation descended from generations of free men, bred to a knowledge of the principles and practice of self-government, of liberty under law, we have a heterogeneous population, no small proportion of which is sprung from races that throughout the centuries have known no liberty at all. In other words, our capacity to maintain our cherished institutions stands diluted by a stream of alien blood with all its inherited misconceptions respecting the relationships of the governed power to the governed. It is no wonder, therefore, that the myth of the melting pot has been discredited. The United States is our land. We intend to maintain it so. The day of unalloyed welcome to all peoples, the day of indiscriminate acceptance of all races, has definitely ended. So much for the land of the free and the home of the brave. So much for send us your tired, your huddled masses. And so much for this being a so-called nation of immigrants. Still, many historians have asked, whether the Immigration Act of 1924 was a good thing, or perhaps at least a necessary thing. Perhaps we might say that some limitation on immigration was desirable. There's only so long a nation can continue to allow unlimited numbers of immigrants coming in from every nation around the world. We can't sustain everyone, after all. The unfortunate outcome of this act, though, was in its discriminatory language and discriminatory impact, targeting certain groups and certain nations in particular. In the long run, eventually this act, the Immigration Act of 1924, would be replaced by the Immigration Act in 1965, some 40 years later. And that Immigration Act would open up the process allowing in large numbers of down the road groups that we would consider problematic for different reasons. Mexican immigrants coming in, those from the Caribbean, 
coming in in large numbers. That is a process to be discussed in a different class and at a different time. So in broad terms, these are the Roaring Twenties, the early 1920s that we associate with jazz music, flappers, and speakeasies, actually begin in a relatively dark atmosphere of fear and suspicion, when many Americans were targeted and terrorized for the color of their skin, their national origin, or their beliefs. This discussion of the Roaring Twenties, and whether in fact they were roaring at all, will be continued in future lectures.